Uh, we can move directly on to our first session, which is an overview of the draft NSABB policy framework and the key questions that we're going to be trying to come to grips with in the course of our time together uh, today and tomorrow. As was evident from uh, Kerry's remarks particularly, the NSABB is central down the final common pathway toward the development of guidelines and recommendations for the conduct of gain-of-function research, its support, and indeed its dissemination. All of these were factors of consideration uh, in the NSABB deliberations, and we're very fortunate to be able to begin uh, this session with an overview presentation about the NSABB state of progress by Samuel Stanley, who is the chair of the NSABB. Dr. Stanley, the floor is yours. So good morning, everyone. Um, I want to begin also by thanking the National Academies for organizing this meeting. I think the first gain-of-function symposium uh, hosted by the Academies played a very important role uh, in informing NSAB's recommendations for the risk-benefit assessment. And I'm really looking forward to a very informative meeting uh, over the next two days. Am I audible okay in the back? Yes? Great. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to be discussing NSAB's progress towards developing recommendations about the funding and oversight of gain and function studies. Um, since the launch of the deliberative process uh, over one year ago, as you've heard, um, the board has been extremely busy. In January, uh, we released and discussed our draft report, which contains our preliminary findings and recommendations. I'm going to provide a brief overview of that report. We would also point out to you the entire report, which I think has been available uh, both in front and is available on our website. I have to tell you that a tremendous amount of effort went into that report. I'm very pleased with it at this stage, but of course it's not finished. It's a draft, as we've said, and the discussions today and tomorrow will be critical to our deliberations moving forward, and I hope will help us to finalize our recommendations. At the end of my presentation, I'm going to announce a few, I'm going to present a few outstanding issues that I hope will be discussed over the next few days. And again, these are vital to our deliberations. As you've heard, in October 2014, the NSAB was issued a two-part charge related to gain-of-function studies. First, we were asked to advise on the design and conduct of risk and benefit assessments for gain-of-function studies. The board accomplished this task in May of last year when we approved our framework for conducting risk and benefit assessments. This framework served to guide Griffon Scientific as they conducted their risk benefit studies. Our second task was to provide recommendations to the United States government on a conceptual approach for evaluating proposed gain of function studies. My presentation today focuses on these draft findings and recommendations. The major elements of the NSAB's draft reports are shown here. In addition to our findings and recommendations, it also describes our analysis of the risk-benefit assessment and our examination of the current policy landscape. We also devote a section to the discussion of ethical values that are important to consider when funding certain gain-of-function studies. The report also details our process and summarizes the important stakeholder input we received during our deliberations. As I said before, this document is still a work in progress, and while our working group has met since the last NSAB meeting, we will wait until after this meeting to issue an updated draft. In general, the working group has focused on three major areas, risk and benefits, ethics, and policy analysis. I highlight on this slide a few key inputs, but this list is certainly not comprehensive. Griffin's risk-benefit assessment provided quantitative and qualitative information that helped us evaluate the potential risks and benefits of gain-of-function studies. An ethics analysis, written by Professor Michael Selgalid, was important to our consideration of ethical issues and decision frameworks that relate to the funding of gain-of-function studies. We also examined relevant domestic and international policies related to biosafety, biosecurity, and dual-use research determine whether and how they might apply to gain-of-function studies. Importantly, underpinning all of our analysis has been the perspectives of stakeholders. 
We have sought input at a number of public meetings, including today's, and received several comments in writing. And this input, again, has been essential to our deliberations. Griffin Scientific presented its risk-benefit assessment at our January meeting. Griffin's presentation and our discussion is archived on the NSAB website. I would urge all who are interested to view that session of our meeting. The risk-benefit assessment represents a truly monumental amount of work, 1,009 pages, and I commend Griffin for putting together a rigorous and comprehensive report. Griffin's analysis, as we will hear, as we will hear from Rocco in the next session, consisted of three main parts an assessment of potential biosafety risks associated with gain-of-function research, a biosecurity risk assessment that included analysis of information risks, and an analysis of the potential benefits of gain-of-function research to public health. Rather than detail NSAB's analysis of the risk-benefit assessment, I thought instead I would describe how the board has used the information from Griffin's study. First, it allowed us to understand the relative risks associated with certain types of gain-of-function studies. The study allowed us to compare whether certain experimental manipulations increased risk. If so, we were able to make determination about whether that increase was significant. Of course, there are many caveats associated with interpreting this assessment. Two that stood out to the NSAB involved uncertainty and the comparative nature of the assessment. Griffin utilized real data whenever possible. However, any risk assessment contains unknown and inherent uncertainty. Therefore, Griffin relied on assumptions and estimations about the likelihood or magnitude of an event occurring. To address some of this uncertainty, Griffin performed a relative risk assessment. They compared the risks associated with potential lab accidents involving a gain-of-function strain with the risks associated with the same accident involving a wild-type strain. This is informative, but the lack of comprehensive estimates of baseline absolute risks makes interpreting the biosafety risks a challenge. All that said, the risk assessment did allow NSAB to identify gain-of-function studies that entail the greatest risks. You will note in our report that we describe gain-of-function studies of concern. These are a subset of studies that NSAB suggests should require additional pre-funding review and ongoing oversight. Griffin's benefit assessment also provided a comprehensive review of the positive benefits and the barriers to realizing benefits associated with gain-of-function studies. This, along with Griffin's discussion of alternative approaches to gain-of-function studies, allowed us to better understand the scientific and public health value of this type of research. The NSAB has focused a lot of attention on ethical issues associated with funding and conducting gain-of-function studies. We recognized early on that interpreting the risk-benefit assessment would require weighing benefits in light of risks and making determinations about policy recommendations. Moreover, those who would make future decisions about whether to fund individual studies will face similar problems. These decisions are essentially value and ethical judgments. To inform discussions about values, an ethics white paper was commissioned that was designed to review the relevant ethics literature, discuss important values relevant to this type of research, and propose decision-making frameworks that may be considered when evaluating gain-of-function research proposals. As I mentioned before, this task was undertaken by Dr. Michael Selgeland, an ethicist at Monash University who has studied the dual-use issue for many years. His paper was very informative and was presented at our meeting in January. The NSAB identified a number of important substantive uh, values listed on this slide, including social justice, scientific freedom, respect for persons, to name a few. These are values that are important when considering whether to fund a gain-of-function study that entails significant risks. We also identified procedural values, including public participation, transparency, and accountability that are very important to any process for reviewing proposals involving gain-of-function studies. The NSAB spent a significant amount of time considering the current federal policy landscape as it applies to gain-of-function studies. We examine the policies listed here and focus particularly on how they relate to gain-of-function work. These policies are discussed in detail in our draft report, so I'll simply touch on some of NSAB's overall conclusions. First, there are multiple policies in place for managing risks throughout the research uh, uh, cycle. 
This include mechanisms for funding, pre-funding review, as well as ongoing federal and institutional oversight of funded projects. However, the effectiveness of the policies depends on proper implementation and compliance at both the federal and institutional levels. Importantly, variations in the scope and applicability of the policies results in different levels of oversight depending on the pathogen and the specific gain-of-function experiment. Taking together our analysis of the risk and benefits, our consideration of ethics, our analysis of the policy landscape, and the input from stakeholders, the NSAB tried to distill our thinking into five key findings. Finding one, there are many types of gain-of-function studies, and not all of them have the same level of risk. Only a small subset of gain-of-function studies, gain-of-function studies of concern, entail risks that are potentially significant enough to warrant additional oversight. Later, I will describe the attributes that constitute gain-of-function research of concern. The next two findings are related. Finding two, the United States government has policy frameworks in place for managing risks associated with life science research. If these policies are implemented effectively, they can serve to mitigate risks and provide oversight to many gain-of-function studies. However, in finding three, we note that oversight policies vary in scope and applicability. This means that current oversight is not sufficient for all gain-of-function studies that raise concern. This figure illustrates how different pathogens are covered under different policies. We see, for instance, that avian influenza H5N1 is subject to all of the, relative, uh, all of the relevant policies, including pre-funding review at the health and human services level for gain-of-function studies involving enhanced transmissibility. However, research involving other influenza strains and SARS and MERS strains, for example, are subject to varying degrees of oversight. For most studies with these pathogens, the level of oversight is appropriate. However, there could be gain-of-function research of concern involving these or other agents that are not subject to sufficient oversight policies. The NSEB's fourth finding is that there are life science experiments that should not be conducted on ethical or public health grounds if the potential risks are not justified by the potential benefits. Funding decisions should be based on consideration of both the risks and benefits associated with the specific experiments in question. Finding five notes that biosafety and biosecurity issues associated with gain-of-function studies are essentially similar to those issues associated with all high containment research. But we note that since gain-of-function research of concern could entail high and potentially unknown risks, a commitment to a culture of biosafety and biosecurity is critically important. With these findings in mind, the NSAB developed its draft recommendations. The first recommendation is that proposals involving gain-of-function research of concern should be reviewed carefully for biosafety and biosecurity implications, as well as for potential benefits prior to determining whether they're acceptable for funding. If funded, such projects should be subject to ongoing oversight at both the federal and institutional levels. As part of this recommendation, the NSAB identified three attributes that would define a study as constituting gain-of-function research of concern. Studies anticipated to generate pathogens with all three of these characteristics should be subject to additional review prior to making a funding decision. They should also be monitored carefully throughout the course of the research if funded. Gain-of-function research of concern would be a study that can be anticipated to generate a pathogen that is, one, highly transmissible and irrelevant mammalian model, two, highly virulent in a relevant mammalian model, and three, is likely more capable of being spread among human populations than currently circulating strains of the pathogen. The first two characteristics are intended to involve the concept of a threshold. That is, the generated pathogen would need to be highly transmissible and highly virulent. Studies involving pathogens with moderate virulence and transmissibility entail risks, of course, but in general, those risks can be managed through existing mechanisms. The third criterion is intended to capture the concept of pandemic potential. That is, a pathogen could spread rapidly among human populations, either because there is no population immunity, no available countermeasures, or for some other reason. The NSAB articulated seven principles that should guide subsequent funding decisions for gain-of-function research of concern. 
The expectation would be that in order to be funded, a proposal would be, need to be in line with these principles. The first is that the research proposal has been evaluated by a peer review process and has been determined to be scientifically meritorious. This concept of scientific merit is very important, and any study that entails significant risk must be considered good science if it is to be conducted. The second principle is that the risks and benefits should be evaluated and the risks be justified in light of the benefits. Importantly, risk should be mitigated wherever possible if the, pro if the plan is to be funded. The third principle, there are no feasible alternatives to address the, science, the same scientific question in a manner that poses less risk. This principle would require an explicit consideration of alternative approaches or experimental designs prior to funding a gain-of-function study of concern. The fourth principle states that the investigator and institution proposing the research have the demonstrated capacity to carry it out safely and securely. This would include adequate resources, security, trained personnel, occupational health and safety procedures, and the ability to adapt to unanticipated results. Number five is that the research information that is anticipated to be generated from the project will be broadly shared in order to realize its potential benefits to global health. Principle six states that the research should be supported through funding mechanisms that include appropriate oversight of all aspects of the research. And the final principle is that the proposed research should be ethically justifiable. This would mean that the broader ethical values and principles should be considered when reviewing a gain-of-function study of concern. It is important to note that the ethical values described a few slides back are embodied, we believe, by a number of the principles listed here. This slide shows a new figure that does not appear in our draft report, but we wanted to present it here for your consideration. The working group has developed this figure over the past few weeks to better illustrate the review process that is envisioned for gain-of-function research of concern. The process would begin with investigators and institutions considering whether a research proposal might entail gain-of-function research of concern. Investigators could flag their proposals as potentially involving gain-of-function research of concern. Next, the proposal would receive a standard scientific merit review. Proposals that are identified as meritorious and likely to be funded would then be examined by the federal funding agency to determine if their project constitutes gain-of-function research of concern. Projects anticipated to generate a pathogen with all three of the attributes I described would be sent for a higher level review before they could be funded. We envision a multidisciplinary review involving broad expertise, including scientific, public health, national security, biosafety, ethical, legal, and other areas. We envision a federal level review that would not be conducted by the specific program that might fund the work, but rather a group that could bring in experts to bear from across the federal government. These reviews would likely be informed by the investigators proposing the studies, as well as the agency that is considering funding it. Only proposals that are in line with all seven of the principles described by NSAB would be considered acceptable for funding. Pro proposals that are determined to be acceptable for funding could then be funded and could proceed in accordance with ongoing federal and institutional oversight. It is important, importantly, it is envisioned that during the higher level review process that additional risk mitigation measures could be identified and if necessary, required as a condition for funding. Our second draft recommendation states that in general, oversight mechanisms for gain-of-function research of concern should be incorporated into existing policy frameworks. Rather than entirely new mechanisms and policies, the working group felt that existing policies, if implemented effectively, could provide an appropriate foundation for oversight. Of note, however, as mentioned before, the level of oversight provided by existing framework varies by pathogen. For some pathogens, existing oversight frameworks are robust and additional oversight mechanisms would generally not be required. For other pathogens, existing oversight frameworks are less robust and may require updating. Recommendation three speaks to a need for continued regular review and reevaluation of projects involving gain of function research of concern. As we know, research is dynamic and what is necessarily anticipated does not always materialize. The risk-benefit profile of a study can change as the work progresses. 
In addition, policies and risk mitigation measures should also be reevaluated to ensure that risks are being adequately managed and oversight remains commensurate with risks. Recommendation number four encourages the United States government to continue its effort to strengthen biosafety and biosecurity for all research involving pathogens. Continuing to build a culture of responsibility will promote the safe conduct of research, including gain-of-function studies of concern. I thought I would conclude by noting a number of questions that the NSAB and our working group has been considering. We sought input on these questions in January, and I hope our panelists today can address them as well. I won't go through them all, but they are available in the NSAB draft report. As the working group has continued its work since the January NSAB meeting, these and other questions have continued to arise. Of note, question two refers to oversight mechanisms, and the working group has been considering whether linking oversight to federal funding is the optimal approach, or whether approaches that would cover non-federally funding research would be necessary or feasible. I will also note question three here, which is a new question the working group has begun to consider. The question asks what type of body should be tasked with the high-level review of gain-of-function research of concern? Would a faca like committee be desirable? Or as now envisioned by NSAB, can such reviews be accomplished by federal agencies or other groups internal to the United States government? This slide lists other questions that we have been thinking about, and your input today on these and other questions will help the working group finalize its draft. We've begun the planning stages for our next NSAB meeting, and we expect the board to convene on May 24th to discuss and possibly vote on an updated report. A notice about this meeting will be forthcoming in the Federal Register, and meeting materials will be made available beforehand. I'll end by encouraging people to submit their comments to the NSAB at our email address. And I want to thank the academies again. I'm looking forward to the presentations from an outstanding group of panelists and to a very interesting next two days. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Dr. Stanley. I, we really appreciate the cogent and clear overview, and it's very, very evident that the NSABB has been uh, not only diligent, but comprehensive and inclusive in the way that you've approached the task. And I think all of us uh, can be very appreciative uh, to you for your leadership, as well as to every member of the NSABB uh, for bringing us to this point. Uh, we hope in the course of, uh, of this day uh, and tomorrow to be able to provide uh, some additional insights and input. Uh, I think the seven questions that you've outlined at the end uh, represent a, uh, a very adequate framework to help uh, guide some of our discussion. And I'd like to make just a couple of introductory comments, if I may, and to share with the group the thinking of the planning committee that tried to organize uh, this discussion so as to enable us to come to grips most uh, fully and completely uh, with the questions and challenges that we're all trying to, uh, trying to understand and to illuminate in the course of these days. Uh, I, I think personally that a really important uh, uh, starting point question is one that you uh, asked us about as to what does qualify and should qualify for research of concern. In fact, in my mind, I think, uh, you know, we use the abbreviation GOF for gain of function. I sometimes think uh, we ought to be also identifying uh, Goff Rock, which is gain of function research of concern. Because uh, exactly what is it uh, that would lead us to uh, want to focus additional attention on a particular subset? Of, uh, of gain of, of function research. And I think this is not a point to gloss over. Uh, it's a very fundamental question, and as you uh, enumerate, the committee has tried to come to grips with this, uh, and I think quite helpfully uh, identified three dimensions uh, according to which a particular research program or project uh, could qualify as being of concern. Uh, I might note that sometimes we use words like of greatest concern or of concern, and I think it's a really important question about defining a threshold when you move from a research program which does not evoke a set of additional concerns to one that does. Uh, to put it another way, 
Uh, one way of thinking about the scientific research enterprise overall is to imagine a starting point at which we all believe that research in general is a good thing because it is a good thing for science to uncover and discover truths of nature. And the scientific merit of any research program that examines and seeks to discover and understand truths of nature intrinsically is a good thing. Uh, at the other extreme, another starting point would be that there's a class of investigation that evokes sufficient concern uh, either from a scientific point of view or from an ethical point of view or from a broader social point of view that would lead that research intrinsically to begin as questionable and where the burden of proof would be on the advocates of the research to justify its continuance. So on the one side, a possible starting point is science is good, when do we question whether it should go forward? And on the other end, a class of research is so dangerous and ill-conceived that it takes a lot of effort to demonstrate why it should go forward. The NSABB has offered these three dimensions of transmissibility, virulence, and resistance as a way of defining a subset of gain-of-function studies that warrant attention, or to put it in terms as I've been describing, where the burden of proof falls on the investigator and the champion of the research to document why it should go forward. One of the features about this which uh, I'd like to raise as a question is it doesn't seem to take account of the starting point of transmissibility, virulence, and resistance in the native organism or the wild organism that one is beginning. In other words, if you have a very resistant organism that is very virulent if contracted, and all you want to do is to test whether the function of transmissibility could be enhanced, why would that be less of concern than starting with a less virulent, less resistant, less transmissible organism and trying to produce increased function along all three dimensions? In other words, conceptually, would it make more sense, perhaps, using these same three attributes, to think about zones of gain of function where concern enters because any combination of the three, any one, two, or three, leads us into a zone of concern outside of what the native organism uh, uh, does represent in terms of transmissibility, virulence, and resistance. And I'd uh, love to get your thoughts about that as we open, uh, open our, uh, our discussion more widely. A second uh, point that I think is uh, uh, very important and uh, that was alluded to by Dr. Hamburg in her opening remarks and others but which I think uh, has to be foremost in our consideration, is that these policies and the decisions that NSABB will recommend are national policies. And yet the challenge is intrinsically a global challenge. Uh, in your remarks, Dr. Stanley, you talked about examining the regimes of biosafety and biosecurity and uh, looking at those internationally as well as domestically. Uh, and I hope that in the course of these two days, uh, we will be able to examine more completely with the help of all of the participants, the issues related to a global regime to manage this uh, class of uh, research of concern uh, in addition and beyond any national uh, regime. Otherwise, I think, and I would say it's the sentiment of the organizing committee, that uh, we won't have done completely the necessary task of providing a adequate framework for the conduct of this research that can go on anywhere in the world. 
Uh, in the course of thinking about how to best organize and bring out the elements that we hope will be useful in the deliberations of uh, NSABB, the organizing committee uh, is setting up the program today to look at the frameworks of thinking about risk and benefit and the overall landscape of the policy environment in the U.S. Uh, and abroad. Uh, tomorrow, we uh, have organized the program so as to be able to delve more deeply into selected uh, aspects of coming to grips with the problem. So we're going to be looking tomorrow at the science of safety and of public deliberation, very important uh, both for the ethical as well as the practical effectiveness of policy. We're going to try to examine uh, the ideas of best practices, which the NSABB has enumerated in terms of its proposals, and we want to both tear that apart and build it back together from the vantage points of the biomedical, public health, and lay communities, and we're going to uh, deal with that. Uh, we do hope to spend time specifically on governance both domestically and uh, globally. And then finally, uh, we'll try our best to take advantage of all of the main ideas and insights that are raised in the course of these two days uh, to bring together in a summary session that, again, we hope will be of use to the, uh, to the NSABB. I'd like to take a moment as we uh, get to the threshold of where we're going to invite uh, comment uh, and input from all who are here to remind everyone about uh, the products that will come out of, uh, of this meeting. There will be, uh, of course, the uh, archived webcast, uh, and that will be available for anyone who wishes to re-examine uh, any part of the discussions that have gone on. We think that should be available uh, as an archive by the end of next week, and all participants will receive an announcement about its availability. There will also be a complete transcript of what is said at this meeting. We hope that that will be available uh, by the end of this month. And that, again, will be posted, and there will be an announcement of its availability. The primary product of this consultative workshop will be a summary of the discussion. This is an account of the presentations and of the comments that are offered by all those who are here or that come into this uh, group uh, from uh, those who are listening and participating uh, on the web. The purpose of this meeting is not to reach any collective views, much less shared conclusions or recommendations. Our purpose is to be able to represent in as coherent and effective a way the central ideas and suggestions for the benefit of the NSABB, the NIH, government policymakers, and others who wish to take advantage. Keep in mind that for the purpose of this meeting, only what is actually expressed at the meeting can find its way into the summary. So if you would like to have your view or ideas included, you have to speak up. There will, of course, be other opportunity, as we've been informed, to provide input separately uh, to the NSABB and to the NIH. But for our purposes, for this meeting, we will take full advantage and do our best to fairly and accurately represent the ideas that are raised at the meeting. When you do offer a comment or pose a question, uh, we'll invite you to the microphone so that your words can be recorded. And I would ask that you state your name and a brief affiliation so that we can accurately attribute the comments in the course of doing uh, the summary. Similarly, uh, we will uh, ask that those who submit questions over the web or via Twitter or other uh, mechanisms identify themselves so that uh, they can also be identified uh, in the summary of this workshop. With that, 
Uh, let me again thank you, uh, Dr. Stanley, for a very cogent uh, introduction. And we're now open to comment, uh, questions, and other advice from those who are present. Please uh, come to a either microphone that is set up uh, on either side of uh, the uh, seating, and we'll recognize people in turn. And I will join you there. Samuel, Great. do you want to say something oh, at the outset? I did. I, I wanted, if, if, with your permission, um, have uh, Joe Canabrocki uh, and Kenneth Burns. Joe Canabrocki from the University of Chicago, Kenneth Burns from the University of Florida, who chaired the working group, join me on stage. Absolutely. Uh, uh, please, uh, let me ask if you would both come forward, uh, Joe and Ken. We, we welcome having your participation. And let me uh, turn to the first speaker at the microphone as they come up. Thank you. We thought we were going to be spared. Uh, this is Dr. Aziz al from Saudi Arabia. I'm a faculty member at King Saud University, a consultant for uh, the Minister of Health, uh, Minister of Agriculture, and Saudi Wildlife Authority. Um, I'm very pleased to be here, and I'm happy to see, you know, you know, uh, what's going on about the gain of uh, function in, in the United States that, you know, everyone wants to make sure that, you know, the researchers are following the rules. But I have a few comments that, you know, um, you know, it might be, you know, addressed to, to, uh, to the audience. Uh, we see, you know, all these, you know, regulations happening in the United States, but what about other countries? Are we thinking about other countries? And uh, from what I, I, I have seen, I'm working on MERS-CoV in Saudi Arabia. So I get so many contacts from so many countries, and people are asking me for collaborative work. Some of them, they have the money, and some of them asking to prepare proposals, you know, to be submitted to the government, mostly on, on, on MERS vaccines and something like that. So some scientists, what I have seen, some scientists, you know, it's kind of like there is a race between, you know, the scientists within the United States and outside. And everyone wants to, to catch up, you know, uh, we are the best group here and, you know, we need to accomplish something. So there is a race. And I'm afraid if someone, you know, okay, we have regulations in the United States, let's move somewhere else to another poor country and there is no regulations and we can do all that research uh, in, in those countries and no one is watching us. It's not about funding from the government of the United States. There's so many companies, and they have money, and they want to, to uh, you know, to get you know something you know done in in, in a short time, p before someone else. So they might go to another country and they do the research. And it did happen for me. Uh, I have been approached by you know several companies uh, to develop vaccines, and they want to do like experimental um, uh, infection uh, on camels. And they said, okay, let's do it in the desert, which is something unusual. So I see like a competition between scientists and uh, they might do it in, in poor countries. This is something else. And sometimes, you know, maybe there is like an, an, uh, a bridge, you know, to go over all these regulations by joining, you know, a US scientist joining another group in Europe or in China or somewhere else. And then, you know, we are doing all the research in, in that country and there is no regulation. So uh, I'm not familiar with the regulations that uh, are proposed this time. But maybe it's not about funding only. It's about you know the ethics. So okay, I have so many difficult regulations within the United States. I'm going somewhere else. I'm joining another group in that country, and then we'll do it, and we'll go over all these uh, challenges. Uh, and you know, my my other point is about you know the the, the gain of function research. That is, uh, you know, in my opinion, it shouldn't be applied just to scientists at universities or institutions, but also to be, you know, expanded to, uh, to private companies. And this is very important because, you know, they have the money and they want to achieve, you know, uh, their goals in a short time. Thank you so much. Thank you very much uh, for the comment and, and point. What I'd like to do is invite a number of speakers and then we'll turn uh, to okay. those who are here. Is that agreeable to you all? You're the boss. Great, okay. Uh, good morning, uh, Piers Millett, Principal of Biosecure and a Global Fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars here in DC. First of all, I'd like to, to thank NSAB for the excellent work that it's been doing in this space. Uh, I have five comments on, on the draft uh, working paper. The first one is how important it is that NSAB opted to make its recommendations broad enough 
to deal with any type of gain of function research more broadly than the specific three uh, types of viruses mentioned in, in the deliberative process. I would encourage you to, as you move forward, and the US government as it reflects on this, to think, uh, to, to set aside taxonomic classifications and to avoid specifying specific agents. Second, I uh, have, um, I'm of the opinion that the existing arrangements may need more review. Uh, policy frameworks may need more review than, than I, I see represented in your report. I think I will come back to that after we've heard from Rocco a bit later on. Third of all, I wanted to point out that interna international engagement on gain of function will need to be a significant component moving forward. That will require resources, it will need to be sustained, and it will need to be a two-way conversation. The US government will need to list very, listen very closely to its international partners. Whilst I like the th concept of thresholds and the three specific areas of gain of function of concern as listed in the report, I wonder whether the barrier of requiring all three is too high and whether if we look at approaches for prioritizing responses in public health and the development of, of, of countermeasures, perhaps two of those three would be enough to trigger greater <coughs> oversight, if not a, a singular binary state of no oversight or complete oversight. And finally, in all areas involving health and security, I think it's important that both communities are involved. So there have been some discussions moving forward of what international settings may be appropriate to, to have those discussions. I would encourage you and the US government to look to balance both health and security and not to opt to move into one or other forum and therefore avoiding perceptions of bias. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me move to the uh, other side and we'll, we'll alternate. Okay, thank you. Oh. Yeah, George Gao uh, from Chinese Center for Disease Control and Prevention and also Chinese Academy of Sciences. So um, uh, from the report, we covered especially you know, for the three major experiments for the transmissibility, uh, virulence, and also for the resistance. Uh, you know, uh, last year, I think uh, uh, a lot of people must already read that paper published for the loss of function. So when you are talking about the GOF, so now someone is doing a side experiment for AROF. When you, you are setting, setting up an experiment, you will never know. So when you expressly do your exp mutation for a particular virus, for example, myself, I'm involved with H7N9 virus. So it's very difficult to predict which amino acid would reduce or increase or enhance the virus ability, uh, virulence, or transmissibility. So I just wonder, so while we are talking a lot about the GOF, should we also evolve, you know, uh, cover the experiment for the ROF? So that's a question I will you know, get out so we can also discuss for the next day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll go back here and alternate. So I am bringing a question from the web. Um, this is from Philippa Lentzos. Uh, it's briefly paraphrased for length. We are a group of international students in global health and social medicine at King's College London. Key themes that have come up in our discussions relating to gain-of-function research of concern relate to the lack of clear and convincing justifications for gain-of-function of concern research, the global dimension of gain-of-function of concern research, and the need for an international solution and the potential for accidents, abuse, and malpractice, amongst others. Our question for today's meeting is, how will you ensure that the lay public's voice, including ours, is heard and incorporated into the decision-making process around gain-of-function of concern research? Thank you. Could you just repeat the third uh, element that they uh, had said that they were uh, Sure. Studying? The potential for accidents, abuse, and malpractice. Okay. Thank you. Hi, uh, Mark Lipsitch from Harvard Chan School of Public Health. Thank you for a uh, helpful presentation. Um, I think that the possibly most essential issue uh, that was, was raised is the first question that Dr. Stanley addressed, raised, which is have the criteria for gain of function of concern been adequately uh, laid out? And I think the, there's been some confusion about the three criteria. Uh, the three criteria were initially virulence, transmissibility, and resistance, and it was, was a necessity to have all three. 
Today, the resistance to countermeasures seems to have been dropped uh, in favor of a new third criterion that's also considered necessary, which is the criterion of being more virulent or transmissible. I didn't actually completely catch it, but worse than things that are <coughs> currently in nature. Um, I think the initial White House charge, uh, the comments of the Infectious Disease Society of America that were submitted recently, uh, and uh, common sense dictate that really the first two criteria alone, together, uh, but without a third criterion, define gain-of-function research of concern. The, whether or not a, a novel agent that's, that combines those, those traits is worse than anything out there is not really the issue, especially because it's hard to know what's out there or how, to, how we would define it or what we would compare it to. Are we comparing it to the seasonal variant that's there now? Are we comparing it to all possible pandemic flus that have ever been? Uh, the comparison makes no sense to me, and, and it seems to me that the, no one was pointing to, these, to any third criterion when they identified the work of, of uh, Fushie Kaoka and, and others uh, as being of concern, and adding a third criterion possibly rules out actually any of the studies that people have been concerned about. So I think the two criteria alone on conceptual grounds make sense and on empirical grounds of what we have actually been concerned about make sense, and I think the third is just a distraction. Thank you. Please. Nicholas Evans, University of Pennsylvania. I'd like to gauge the committee's, um, on the, the NSABB members' uh, views on two issues uh, presented here today. The first is how they see this proposed regulatory framework um, that happens during the funding process to interface with the dual use research of concern policy put forward by the NIH in 2014 and then uh, implemented through 2015. The second is regarding the, the ethical values that were listed uh, in uh, Professor Stanley's slides and how they see that um, moving forward in terms of this multidisciplinary assessment that is purported to, to happen. Um, it occurs to me that in the history of biomedical ethics and human subjects research ethics, uh, we have often made, we bioethicists have often made a reference to beneficence and the benefits of research, but actually articulating what those benefits are has been a very, very challenging process in human subjects research. And so having those big four values plus two seems to be a much bigger challenge again. Thanks. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Tom Inglesby from the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. Thanks for those presentations this morning. Uh, I, just two comments. The first is I think there's a lot to commend in the NSAB, NSABB working group paper, in particular the finding that um, the current oversight structure is insufficient for all GOF studies of concern. I think that was finding three. I agree with that. It's important. Another finding is that some research should not be conducted at all if potential risks outweigh benefits, which I agree with. I partially agree with the first recommendation in the working group report, which is that studies of greatest concern generate highly transmissible, highly virulent virus. And this has been discussed by a number of speakers. I do not really agree or understand the criteria that was in the report before. It seems like it may not be in it now, but that experiments of concern also have to be, quote, resistant to public health controls. I think if a virus is made to be highly transmissible and highly virulent, that alone is the definition of being resistant to public health controls and that we should not try to kind of pretzel ourselves into thinking about what another definition of public health controls might be. We don't control seasonal influenza at this point and um, I think that speaks for itself. I don't agree with the uh, something that I don't know if it was discussed this morning but I think is in the report still which is that U.S. government funding is really the only mechanism of control of this work if it's deemed to be not justifiable risks versus benefits. I think we need to think about additional mechanisms. Certainly, U.S. government is, the only, is not the only entity that might fund these. It could be private research. It could be other government research. So I do think, just in keeping in, in the long view, funding or no funding is not a sufficient mechanism of control if we determine that th this does need to be controlled. And, and then finally, I would just commend to the group that uh, I think hopefully by the end of two days we'll be talking broadly about 
policy options. I know we're not, this is not a decision meeting and policies aren't gonna be made here, but I do think that we're getting to a point where policies will need to be made this summer or sometime at the conclusion of the process. So I hope that we will be able to get to discussion of concrete policies. And to that end, I would, I would say that my colleagues, Dr. Lipsitch and Dr. Roman and I have circulated a document that suggests some possible policy options that might be useful for you to consider. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just say that we're, uh, although we're not uh, going to be trying to do any collective decision making, we definitely welcome uh, specific policy guidance and specific recommendations. In fact, I would say the more specific the comments that any of us offers, the more likely it is to actually be useful uh, to the NSABB process. So uh, we welcome those specific, uh, specific uh, elements as well. Please. Megan Palmer, I'm a senior research scholar at the Center for International Security and Cooperation at Stanford University. Um, and I want to thank you for the discussion so far, and I'm looking forward to the discussions the next two days. Um, I wanted to note that many of the questions that came up as items for further consideration in the NSABB um, draft report do recapitulate some of the central questions that were charged to the committee at the beginning of this process, um, notably the adequacy of current oversight institutions and the adequacy of the current dual-use research of concern frameworks. And also, um, whether or not um, these oversight mechanisms, um, the discussion at the last NSAB meeting regarding um, how to establish meaningful norms either through strong red lines or through these processes um, came up as a central question. Um, I wanted to ask, considering the, the notable focus of this meeting on what are best practices around oversight, what were your key lessons in either the limitations on expertise or the limitations in the process um, that you came up against in trying to address these questions about the adequacy of oversight? Are there things that you would like to see um, addressed in the course of these panels regarding best practices for oversight um, or any places where we aren't resourcing or gathering expertise currently? Thank you. Uh, Megan, just to clarify for a moment, did, when you uh, talk about the adequacies, are you referring to the policy level or the institutional and researcher levels? Is it more the policy process that you were asking about? I think it's both. I think this question of how do we gather the data that we need in order to assess the adequacy of current policies and current institutions, mm -hmm. and um, was this um, a problem even in the process of the current deliberations? Very good, thank you. KG. Hi, KG Fukuda, WHO. Um, so f first I wanna thank, thank the uh, panel and the board for the materials that you put together. They're really very well done, and I think the process to date has been, has really covered a lot of the issues. But, um, you know, coming from Geneva, there are a couple of things that I was struck by, or let me put it this way. Coming from influenza and having worked on some of these viruses and then having worked on some of the issues, dual use issues, which really came to a fore a few years ago, um, you know, this is a, a bit of a precise discussion. It has to do with viruses, has to do with gain of function, but beyond gain of function, gain of function of concern. And I think, Harvey, in your remarks up there, you were saying something about of concern and what does that mean. And coming from a global perspective, one of the things that I'm struck by at that level is that uh, I think of concern is really one of the critical issues here. It's easy to understand why we focus on viruses, and particularly viruses of pandemic potential. I think that the relevance of H5N1 and H7N9 and MERS and so on is clear. But I think it's also clear that um, if we take a, a further step backwards, there are uh, studies which involve animals, there are studies which involve genetic manipulation going beyond viruses. And at the global level, I think it's probably hard to have an overly precise discussion about many of these concerns. And to give you an example, I think that um, 
if we look at genetically modified foods, in which we're not talking about safety or so much security concerns, but still at the global level, a lot of the issues which will be discussed are um, how would it relate to biological diversity, what kind of impact does it have there, what kind of commercial impact does it have, what kind of implications will it have in terms of uh, you know, the foods which are being grown and the, and the requirements for that. And so I'm just raising these issues because I think that, uh, you know, as Pierre has indicated, this is not just a national issue. It will become an international, or it has international implications. And I think that in looking ahead at how such a discussion would unfold, I think that over the next couple of days, these kind of issues um, you know, it will be helpful to address in here. It's, you know, what is the scope of the question? And is that going to be sufficient for taking it forward internationally? Thank you very much. Please. Uh, hello, Catherine Rhodes from the University of Cambridge Center for the Study of Existential Risk. So I work broadly in the area of international governance of genetic resources. So I want to, again, make some uh, comments on the international situation. So the first one is that as well as engaging with the health and security fields, there will be a need to engage with access and benefit sharing regimes in this area. Um, the second is to, to really think about your engagement with the scientific community. Um, so there was a, a meeting about two weeks ago in the UK Parliament on how safe is pathogen research. And talking to people there who are doing uh, some of the influenza research, they were asking how could they get international standards without having it dominated by the US process. Um, and I think that was largely based on misperception at the moment of what the US process is and a fear that that would uh, incorporate bans of classes of experiments. So that's a perception coming from the scientific community at the moment, and I think there's a need to make sure you're engaging so that you know, some of these misperceptions um, or misinformation is uh, sort of dealt with. Thank you very much. Please. Michael Selgalid, Center for Human Bioethics at Monash University. Thanks for all the great work on this uh, important issue. I have two main points. One concerns to the delineation of gain-of-function research of concern. You know, one might argue that there's not two kinds of gain-of-function research, that which is con of concern and that which is not of concern, but there's you know, a whole spectrum of pertaining to degrees of concern. So one could argue that gain-of-function research is more or less concerning depending upon the degree to which the pathogen created is more transmissible or not, more virulent or not, or more resistant or not to existing control measures. Beyond uh, existence of control measures, we should also keep in mind availability of control measures that might exist. And the move, if I understand correctly, to a binary conception is the idea that we need to decide if it's concerning or not to decide if we're going to have extra scrutiny of the study or not. But we're not forced into that situation because we can recognize that there's more or less concerning research. We can say the more concerning the research in question, the more extra scrutiny we need. So the response can be scalar as well as the conceptualization of the research we're talking about. So we shouldn't forget about that. We should also keep in mind that that's maybe a more realistic way of addressing this issue, because I'm not sure where thresholds for transmissibility or virulence or resistance would come from without pulling them out of a half, right? So what would be a scientifically realistic way of setting these supposed thresholds? That's the first point. The second point concerns the um, diagram that was presented about the process of addressing gain-of-function research of concern. And if I understood that correctly, first there's an evaluation of whether or not the study is scientifically meritorious, and then there's looking at whether or not it's a research of concern, and then there's the, the side process that might happen, scrutinizing it with regard to concerns about it being of concern. And then it either passes a test or not. It's either ruled out on grounds of concern about it being of concern or not, and if it passes that test, then it gets to the box where it says considered for funding. This raises the question of whether or not at that stage the gain of function um, 
uh, aspect of the study should be taken into consideration because what because when it's considered for funding, presumably it's going to be in competition with other studies that have gotten to that stage in the process. And you might think that if there's two studies that are equally scientifically meritorious and that have both passed the test of not being ruled out on grounds of being of concern, that other things being equal, it's better to fund a less risky study if we can't fund both. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you're next. Good morning, John Steele, Emory University. Uh, uh, I got a laboratory at Emory that works on the transmission of influenza. So my, my question is, is one relating to, to your initial finding that the gain of function of concern studies relate to viruses that are highly transmissible. And I, I just want to ask, is it, how are you going to define highly? So you're going from a situation from non-transmissible or transmissible to, to highly, which is sort of, if you want to say semi-quantitative definition. Um, and it, that might sound like it's a down in the weeds question, but really it's when, when studies are going to go in front of institutional biosafety committees, how do they decide what is highly transmissible given the, the animal models that we use are fairly blunt. There's one out of three transmissions not highly transmissible, but two out of three is. So is it the intention of the board to uh, make some kind of guidelines in terms of a definition of highly transmissible? Or is it more the intention to allow the, the IBCs to decide that and then the, the studies work their way up from, from the bot? Thank you very much. I hope you've all been listening carefully because there's a lot of comment here uh, to uh, invite your response. Uh, and uh, uh, Joseph, maybe we could begin with you and just work our way down, if that's agreeable to everyone. Uh, I'd welcome your uh, initial reactions to anything, but I hope that the group particularly will reflect on the array of perspectives raised around this core question of what qualifies as being of concern. Uh, we've heard uh, a number of, of points of view about that. Uh, a uh, question of whether all three criteria are necessary, a uh, question of whether it's sensible to really try to define thresholds as opposed to continuities, uh, which invites then a very practical question of what exactly defines a threshold, a uh, question of whether, uh, depending on where you start, even one of the three could be sufficient to make this research program of concern uh, and so forth. So we have a lot of comment just on that uh, question, which I hope you'll come to. Then uh, lots of uh, uh, observations and reflections on some of the, uh, let's call it uh, international or global dimensions of this, including the movement of researchers, the scope of research that might be related, the nature of uh, the governance processes, et cetera. Uh, and I would really uh, welcome your comments as well uh, on that uh, in addition to the specific questions or observations on regulatory framework and, and approach. So Joseph, I'll begin with you and, and uh, really welcome all of your uh, initial reflections. So thank you. I, uh, a lot of great points were made, and I think many of the comments made uh, really reflect the discussion that the working group had over these many months. Uh, we, we've struggled greatly with a lot, a lot of these issues that you've raised here today. I, I'll begin by addressing, I think, maybe the one that's the central question, the, the three phenotypes that, that we're looking at here. And it's been suggested that we've kind of shifted our, our thinking on the third criterion. And I don't think that's really true. I think there was a, in the original, in the way the original language was written, there was a misinterpretation of that to mean, uh, to be limited to resistance only. Uh, and really we meant more to, to have that be taken more broadly such that, and, and as it's now worded, it's about being capable of spread, mm -hmm. you know, basically the pandemic issue. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know that's you know that takes into consideration the back the background of the virus that's being managed, and whether uh, there's herd immunity potentially to that virus. Uh, and it's not just about resistance to countermeasures. So the, the third criterion is, is it was originally intended to be more broad than it was than it was interpreted. And again, we heard a number of times this morning that the focus being on resistance that wasn't our sole focus, though. Okay. Others, Ken. You're up. 
in terms of specifically about... Do you want to just discuss this point? this point? I mean, maybe we should stay on this point uh, first because uh, there are lots of uh, vantage points. I, I, let me just ask you uh, directly, do you uh, uh, believe that all three uh, attributes should be present uh, in order to make a proposed experiment uh, in this category of concern, holding aside the important observation about continuity. And I, I would really love to hear your thoughts well, on this. I guess I come from the point of view that what's important is what you wind up with. Yeah. <clears throat> and several of the attributes may have been there to start with. And so what we're really concerned about is the potential for a pandemic. And so the question of whether or not there are existing defense mechanisms uh, which would inhibit the development of a pandemic, I think, is an important consideration. And uh, I thought Tom Inglesby made the point we're not too terrific with seasonal flu. Uh, and th that depends upon the year, of course, and which vaccine we're using. But I think that accepting that variability, I think the issue of whether or not, at least in practice, there's some way of, uh, of blocking the spread is an important consideration. And so I think that third point is actually a very important point. Mm -hmm. Sam, do you want to comment? Well, I, I think that what the working group was trying to drive at was, and I think it came out in the risk-benefit analysis as well, <laughs> is are you creating a risk that's above uh, and ex significantly above an existing risk for that pathogen. So in other words, and you know, we can say it's a slightly different strain or whatever, but for that pathogen, you're creating something that goes beyond the, the risk that already exists for that pathogen. So in other words, it's a different strain and so on. So if you uh, take a look at the example again, and influenza is the one that was utilized, um, changing it and yet if the same antivirals are still effective, if vaccines potentially are still effective, is that risk above the risk that's done every day for people who are working with influenza? So why is this particular research then singled out if that ultimate risk doesn't look different? I think that's what was trying to be driven at is that you're creating something, again, where there's not natural immunity. So in a situation where it's an H5N1, for example, that there is a natural immunity present, you now are able to transmit it uh, much more effectively than it could before if that's the end result, then that does clearly, in my mind, can, you know, uh, translate to gain-of-function research of concern is something one needs to deal with. If one was working with a seasonal flu strain uh, and altered one component of it, and yet the same defenses were still in place, I, I can see the point. If it became much more virulent, that's a potential issue, so I can see the point there. And I think, you know, I, and I said, so I think there's, there's always been a question, is that last point an and or an or? Uh, for each of these criteria, and I think this is what we want to discuss today. It'd be, I think it would be interesting to hear other views in the course of the meeting, and uh, Ken, I was taken with your observation that it really depends on where you end up, that that's what's crucial, not uh, where you've started and what the trajectory is from there to the end. Uh, and I think that the questions about uh, thresholds for policy action, uh, if you get very practical, is really uh, not a trivial question uh, as was amplified by the comment about the continuity of uh, these uh, attributes as well. Uh, would you like to comment, uh, any of you, on how are you thinking about uh, the relation between the process that you've been involved with for the U.S. government and the NIH and what is happening elsewhere in the world? Uh, do you have any preliminary reflections on that? Is it just beyond the mandate of your uh, NSABB assignment? Uh, or how would, you, uh, how would you find it most helpful from the point of view of comments that we'll uh, raise in the course of the next two well, days? We, we've brought in uh, people from the uh, EU to talk to us about uh, uh, the EU approach to this question. I think, uh, and that was very interesting uh, and useful to the uh, working group, uh, which actually constitutes, I think, almost a majority of the NSAPB. Yes. It's a large group. Uh, so that, that was helpful. I think uh, two things have struck me. One is that um, uh, 
many places around the world, in fact, have considered this issue. Uh, they're approaching it. Um, I don't know that any other country has instituted a moratorium on this research, which I think is a comment unto itself, which stands by itself. Um, and I think the, the, the fears that have been expressed by some that people who don't want to be bothered by a moratorium simply move elsewhere to do their, uh, to do their work uh, probably is, uh, is a real concern to a, to a certain extent. I think, uh, but what all of this sort of glides over is the question that arose uh, in a major way when we considered the original H5N1 papers at our level. And that is the fact, the ability of uh, people who are not part of the normal organization uh, to be able to do the research anyhow in this day and age. As the point was made to me by Dr. Camillan this morning, uh, you can buy a CRISPR kit now. And so the ability to do lots of oh, things at the molecular Sounds level fabulous. is possible. Like and, and, and so that, that's Those of things. some yeah, concern. And, and potentially them. more than bioterrorists per se uh, might be a real source of, uh, of something coming out that we'd yeah, be unhappy with. Reason. Because it's unlikely that the kinds of containment that we assume in an institutional setting uh, will exist in that type of research. Yeah, that uh, I think uh, abuts the comment that uh, Dr. Fukuda raised about the way this blends into uh, research concerns completely outside the domain of uh, uh, infectious disease, never mind uh, virus uh, uh, pandemic potential. Uh, Sam, you wanted to add? Well, it's clearly an international issue. Yeah. Um, but our primary task was to advise the, the U.S. government. But I think uh, all members, I think, of NSAB, and as well as uh, those who sponsor us, um, believe that we do need uh, to try and strive for a global solution here, and that some type of harmonization, essentially, of these processes would be extraordinarily valuable. And that extends, I think, to the issues around biosafety. Um, yeah. One of the things that, uh, you know, one of the important recommendations we've made is that we want to see standards of biosafety and that for research to go forward that would be gained in function research of concern, we want to see established biosafety and biosecurity uh, standards. And so I think that's important as we look globally as well. And so I think, you know, the United States is, is typically a leader in these areas. So I think developing policies hopefully uh, could serve as a way for which uh, we could uh, collaborate with other scientific organizations as well as other governments. I think both of those are going to be important. And I think what was raised earlier, uh, and Ken just talked about, about the challenge of going outside uh, federally funded research, I think is one that we've uh, de tried to deal with as well, or at least talked about, is how one captures industry research and so on. I think often <coughs> the biotechnology industry tends to uh, uh, collaborate or, or comply on their own mm -hmm. uh, with federal regulations, if not for liability reasons and nothing else. So I think in general there's not a huge dichotomy um, between the groups, but I think that's another thing that we're thinking about as well, is yeah. is there a way to expand essentially these type of processes so it captures more than just federally funded research? Thank you. Yeah, I would just add that, you know, we, We've had a lot of the discussions around these three major issues, and you know the, the international aspect is obviously very critical, and we recognize that. There's been this tension between uh, the, the real threat versus what is our charge, and and you know our charge is really limited to U.S. funding of research with gain of with uh, pandemic potential, so it was really limited to the human public health realm. That said, we had many discussions that took it beyond the human health uh, 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 cons considerations, and, um, and so the, the funding piece, uh, we, you know, the international component, and the, the, the public health aspect, those are three things that we, we definitely spent a lot of time discussing, but going back to our charge, mm. uh, there's some tension there. Yes. Uh, Ken, do you want to add something to yeah, it? Yeah, I, I think that... Um, the challenge of international harmonization is, uh, is a big one. Uh, I'd like to commend the paper that was mentioned by uh, Tom Inglesby and Mark Lipsich, co-authored a, a third person. Um, 
which offers several approaches that might be taken on the international level to try to approach this. I thought the suggestions uh, were cogent. Uh, I'm not sure how practical it really is, but I think it's a starting point to think about this. Yeah, and I would just add, I mean, international harmonization would be wonderful, but we could start by having harmonization within the U.S. Uh, that would be a big help. Um, and I think the other thing I'd add is that a lot of the concepts that were developed by NSAP for dual use have found uh, homes internationally as well. So I think yeah. there has been an opportunity both, and there's been fer cross fertilization mm -hmm. uh, between other countries and their policies and what we do. But I think that also gives me some hope that what we adopt in the U.S. could find its way, assuming that it is uh, uh, viewed as an appropriate response, yeah. could find its way internationally. Has the NSABB in its deliberations uh, gone so far at this point of identifying the actual, uh, not simply directionalities of transmissibility, virulence, et cetera, but the actual way to think about when a threshold of concern is passed, uh, either in terms of, for example, a set of reference organisms or in some other numeric or quantitative way, or if you think about the actual assignment to a future group, uh, maybe yourselves, who are going to be asked, uh, does this or does this not qualify? Uh, how will you judge? Uh, have you thought about that as yet? I think those are two different questions. How you predict biologically what the consequences are <clears throat> is a guessing game. I mean, you can say, wow, this seems potentially dangerous. The trouble is how you calculate that risk in a quantitative sense is challenging, and we saw that in the Griffin report. Yeah. And uh, so I, I don't know, the, I mean, we can only sort of do it in a generic sense without being all that specific. I think the question which we, we've grappled with more <clears throat> is the level at which that decision is going to be made, does this specific experiment constitute such dire gain of function of concern that we don't think it should be done? And um, so, the, and so the issue is: should that be, should that final decision, if you will, be made inside the government or in a FACA approach? Uh -huh. And uh, the, I think the issue, uh, and I mean, the NSABB is a factor, but that's beside the point in a sense. But I think the, uh, the efficiency sense, in a way, says maybe it should be inside the government. But the public interest and transparency sense would argue very strongly for a uh, FACA. And uh, I was on the IOM committee that looked at the fate of the rack most recently, and that was the major reason that we suggested that the rack be retained because it was the only window that the public had into what was going on. Yeah. Any uh, final comments you'd like to make on any of the other points that were raised before we conclude? Uh, I just echo what Joe said, that uh, extraordinarily thoughtful and uh, helpful. Uh, in terms of their scope and scale. And as we said, some of we've wrestled with, others I think brought some new perspectives and a yeah. uh, very helpful start. Well, I hope over these two, sorry, Joseph, no, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say another major thing we've struggled with is how specific do we wanna be in our recommendations or do we wanna stay back at the more uh, conceptual level? And, and that's, you know, we've, we've gone back and forth on that. And uh, yeah. uh, so again, some of the comments that were made were calling for rather specific uh, guidance, and we've struggled with whether that's going to be ultimately useful as something that can be used for overall gain of function research analysis. Yes. It's very hard when you're making the recommendations also to put yourself in the mindset of the recipient. Uh, but if you did that and asked, well, how would I actually act now if I received this, it might help answer that question for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Kenneth, anything you want to add before we conclude? No, I think I'm. I'm fine, thank you. Great. Well, I want to thank everyone who participated thus far. Uh, please uh, keep in mind, uh, we welcome your comments and ideas throughout this meeting. I hope that we will provide an abundance of input that will enable uh, NSABB uh, to come to the 
uh, fullest uh, understanding and put forward the most helpful final recommendations uh, that they can come up with. Thank you all for joining us in the opening session and thank you all for participating. We will resume at 11 o'clock. We'll come back at 11 o'clock one half hour from now.